angels sing, glory to the newborn king. I can sing it, but I can't play it. So what makes Lent different than any other time of year? Are we not looking for ways to connect, maybe to reconnect with the Jesus, and ultimately with the full Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Advent, like I was just singing, it's a time to prepare for the coming of Jesus. This season, it sets a tone all of its own. It's all about rejoicing. Listen to the upbeat hymns and the carols associated with, with it. Thereafter, there's a short lull where one can take a breath. Then it's full-blown Lent, beginning with Fat Tuesday. Traditionally, this time is meant to be more somber. You know, honestly, I don't know why. Yes, Jesus does go to the cross. And if that were all, we should not only be somber, but fearful. What hope would there be? I suggest I would recommend that we change this downhearted nonsense and begin to rejoice. In fact, shout it from the mountaintops. Jesus came to save those who could not save themselves. There needed to be a price paid for our sinful nature, and Jesus was more than willing to pay that price for us. That is definitely a cause to be praising and to celebrate, not to be somber. Similarly, to the somber tones during Lent were the hymns that were written during the 1800s. These hymns were steeped in theological content and were often used to be meditative. Sometime around the turn of the century, though, there was a shift of style in the gospel music. Now, Charles Gabriel, in his hymn, I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus, reflected that change. This new innovative style of music helped Dwight Moody and Billy Sunday to not only to attract people, but to inspire people at their revivals. It wasn't long before Christians everywhere learned to love songs that were fun to sing, were highly energetic, and were easy to remember. I wish I could tell an amazing story of how this song came to be. There isn't one. Mr. Gabriel was one of the most prolific composers of his age. He has accredited to his name between seven to 8,000 songs, 35 gospel song collections, Sunday school song books, collections for men and women choirs, numerous cantatas, including 41 Christmas cantatas, and music education texts. Not bad for a boy who graduated from an Iowa farm. Now, the Reverend Carlton Young, an editor of the United Methodist Hymnal, he notes, this is a song of gratitude and praise for the atoning death of Jesus is a personal interpretation of Luke's account of Jesus sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Just like a few others that we're going to take a look up, there seems to be a personalized narrative to these songs. There, there's something about how these authors want to be drawn in. And I'm going to tell you some backstories of some other songs where this really happened in their minds. But for this one, he did take from the text found in Luke chapter 22, and he began to place himself there. Let's read the text first. It's Luke 22, 39 to 44. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew 
about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Not my will, but your will be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Now that's scripture. Now let's listen to the hymn. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. For me it was in the garden he prayed, not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood for mine. In pity's angels beheld him and came from the world of light to comfort him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. When the ransom and glory his face I at last shall see, t'will be my joy through the ages to sing his love for me. Now the refrain, it's beautiful. It's something that sticks with us. I, I, I remember this from my own childhood. I can remember standing on a pew saying, How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love to me. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love to me. It takes me to a chapter that isn't found in Ephesians, the first chapter. It, in Ephesians, it clearly states that we are loved both as a group and as individuals. Before the stars were created and placed in the skies, we were known. A plan was put into place to save us from ourselves. The Trinity knew that we would become selfish and we would want to control our own lives as if we were gods. All those wonderful hymns that we've sung during Christmas season prepared us for a Savior, one that came to be a witness to God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus was more than a witness and even was the perfect example on how to live one's life. But he came to provide a price of the penalty for sin, our sin. And that sin continues to separate people from the Trinity today. These verses in the song give us a glimpse that Jesus was also fully man, in that he asked God if it was possible to take this cup of death, this suffering that was going to come away from him. But he knew that while he was praying, that it was God's will that needed to be done. And so there in the garden, he prayed for each of us. And in those moments, he saw your face. He saw mine. And it burdened him so that his heart was breaking to the point where he sweated blood. And that blood dropped onto the ground. Some want to think that's just a metaphor. Some want to think that's just a nice story. But I truly believe that God, Jesus, loved us so much and he anguished so much over our sin that drops of blood fell onto the ground with our very name on them. Have you ever prayed that hard? Have you ever wanted something so bad? I don't think we've prayed that hard for anything. But it's time. It's time that we begin to pray for those who are around us, that they will find this same kind of love, that Jesus loves them so much, that he was willing to be beaten to the point where he was not recognizable. 
And that's what this song is. This is the garden song before he entered the next day into the city to be beaten. We're going to pick that up more next week as we talk about the cross. But pray with me today, will you? Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for what you've done. I thank you that you loved us, that you came for us, that you went to this garden and you didn't walk away. You didn't say that we weren't worthy. Instead, you prayed for us and we were lifted up into the very heavens on your lips. Help us now to lift up others, those that we care for, those that we love, that they too will hear about your love. I put all of this into your name, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.